So here, the Lenara Connect, uh, Hong Kong 2018. Um, next year is going to be important, right? Yes, 2019 is going to be very important. Uh, there's a series of anniversaries that are happening at that time. And I think that these anniversaries are important to remind people of how we've built on the shoulders of giants. So the first anniversary that I should talk about is the birth date of Unix itself, done by Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie in Bell Labs in New Jersey. It was an opportunity to create an operating system that was portable, that would run across different pieces of hardware. Up until that time, operating systems tended to be fixed around the hardware which they made or the applications which they ran. So you had operating systems that specialized in batch or oper operating systems that specialized in time sharing, operating systems that specialized in, re in real time. And Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie wanted an operating system that would be flexible. And so they created Unix. And at first, Unix took off very, very slowly. But over time, it gained in popularity. So flexible in, in which other ways? Like, uh, uh, it, it like has operating systems that can do more things differently than whatever was there before? Yes, uh, as an example, on the PDP-11 computing system from Digital Equipment Corporation, there was 11 different operating systems. There was RT-11, which was real-time, RSX-11, that was slightly real-time, but also time-sharing. There was Ristus, that was time-sharing for educational use. There was a Unix system. And all of these different operating systems basically on one architecture of hardware because the address space of those systems was only 64,000 bytes of memory and you didn't have a lot of space to put all the different types of functionality in the operating system itself. What Unix did was have a very small kernel and then lots of functionality out in user space. And this made it very portable as it could go across different pieces of hardware. So a small kernel, a more efficient design or something? It was very efficient for the uh, hardware of the day. And one of the things you need to think about when it comes to an operating system kernel is the more code and functionality you put inside the kernel, the more likely there is to be some type of mistake. And when that mistake happens, the entire operating system crashes. Uh, if you have the functionality in libraries outside of the kernel, then it may be that one part of the application stops, but the kernel itself continues. And the operating system can relaunch that application and continue on. So the operating systems of that day that had a lot of functionality inside of the kernel were less stable because of that amount of functionality. So uh, those two uh, guys who started the Unix, where were they? W w where did they work? Was it something to do with AT&T? Yes, uh, Bell Laboratories was a branch of AT&T. It was a pure research branch. As you're developing products and things like that, you may start off with pure research, something that may not be practical for people to use, but you're trying to gain information about the subject. After that, you may move it into advanced development, where you take the pure research and aim it towards some type of product that might come out. After that, you may take the advanced development project and move that into production engineering to make it more manufacturable, more usable by human beings and, and other things. So Bell Labs was doing the pure research part. And out of Bell Labs came things like the transistor, um, fiber optics, you know, lasers, and things like that, that later on became extremely useful to lots of people other than the telephone company. And Ken Thompson had been working on a project called Multics, along with MIT, uh, GE, and a series of other companies and his management decided to pull him off of that project 
because at that time uh, they believed that computers were not really useful to telephone companies and that uh, if, the, if the government thought that AT&T was getting into computers, that that would be very bad for the economy. So Ken Thompson came back to Bell Laboratories and started this little project that he was just doing for fun called Unix. And he was joined by Dennis Ritchie. Uh, they worked on it for a long period of time. They used a cast off computer that nobody wanted called a PDP-7. And they did the programming strictly in machine language. They, in fact, they could not even assemble the operating system on that computer. They had to cross-assemble it using another computer system, produce a, a binary t paper tape, and use that to load into the PDP-7 to run. And uh, was this some, something to do with Berkeley involved too? Berkeley came much later. Uh, after a couple rounds of working on this and where Ken, Ken and Dennis uh, pulled in other people from Bell Labs, uh, people like Douglas McElroy, Stephen Bourne, and a variety of others, Ken would go on sabbatical and he would go and teach at universities about operating system design. And he would take along a magnetic tape of his favorite operating system. And one of those universities he went to was, of course, University of California, Berkeley. They started looking at it, they started working on it, and they would add all sorts of things to the Linux, oh, sorry, to the Unix operating yeah. system. Um, over a period of time, the two systems began to diverge a little bit. Uh, you would have AT&T Unix, which became System 3, System 4, System 5, and then you would have Berkeley Unix, BSD, that would come out with their own versions. And so about 1983, there was the beginning of computer companies like Digital Equipment Corporation, uh, IBM, Hewlett Packard, who really started to think about this academic thing called Unix and seeing that it had commercial use. And they would start bringing their own out their own distributions. Part of this was because if you use the source code of AT&T or even the source code of Berkeley, you had to pay a $160,000 license per CPU. And you had to give the serial number of your CPU to AT&T. So first you had to even find the person inside of AT&T to give the serial number to, and then you had to pay the money and if you wanted to move this, the code from one CPU to another you had to call them back up again and say well we're moving our code to this other CPU because the first one is broken he, you know here's the, the serial number now people today would think this is ridiculous because I'm, I'm sure you know the serial number of your laptop so this is very hard and after a while, companies like Sun Microsystems went to AT&T and said, look, if we bring out a binary only distribution, not the source code, would you give us a lower cost license? And would you ask for the serial number? And AT&T thought about that and said, no, this is okay. If we do that, we'll reduce your license fee to perhaps $350 per CPU. And you don't <coughs> need to have the binary license. So all of these companies started to produce their own versions of Unix. Some of them based them on the AT&T code. Some of them based it on the code from the University of California, Berkeley. The Berkeley code, quite frankly, had some nice features to it at the time. The System 5 code was only a swapping system at that time. It didn't have the man page virtual memory. It did not have TCP IP. It had UUCP as its networking, as a stored forward networking style using modems. Berkeley Unix had demand page virtual memory and it had TCP IP, which actually brings about a second anniversary in the year 2019. Because in 1969, the ARPANET was started. And of course, the ARPANET became the forerunner of the internet. 
So by around 1983, when these things started up, when Berkeley Unix was coming into its own, the internet was being used to communicate between large systems and uh, around the world. So a lot of these vendors chose Berkeley Unix instead of System 5 because of these features that System 5 did not have. Uh, and then uh, at some point, uh, this Unix stuff was uh, seen by Linux Torvalds, or what? Well, uh, there was a couple things that happened around that time. There was, uh, there was a little company called BSDI who wanted to take uh, Berkeley Unix and make a distribution of it. And they said, oh, well, there's all this code that was written yep. by Berkeley. And, you know, do we really have to pay any licenses anymore for this to AT&T? And so they started to distribute their code and AT&T started to sue them. So all of this was going on. It was leaving uh, BSD in jeopardy. Let's put it that way. Meantime, we back up a little bit. We back up to 1984, where there was a student at MIT by the name of Richard Stallman, and he objected to all these systems that he had been getting in source code, now turning into binary-only systems. He couldn't see how they worked. It made it difficult for him to write device drivers for various devices that he got. And he decided to start a project called GNU, which stands for GNU is not Unix, to rewrite all of the code in the Unix system to be free and open source code. Actually, free software, he would say. And he started with a text editor called Emacs, and he made that run across a wide variety of different operating systems and architectures, so that if you learned Emacs on one system, you would have Emacs on all the different systems. Then he went on to create other things like a compiler suite of languages that were useful on all of these different systems. And he kept building and building these different pieces of software and incorporating and bringing other people into this project, which he called GNU. In 1995, he formed a free software foundation that helped to run and fund the GNU project. So a little bit later on, in 1991, there was a university student at the University of Helsinki who started to write a kernel because the last piece missing from the GNU system was really the kernel of the operating system. And a lot of people say, well, why didn't Richard Stallman start with the kernel first? Well, he might have done that. He might have been able to write a kernel, but then he would have no software to run on top of it. And by the time he got software ported to that kernel, the, the kernel itself would be old and crusty and obsolete. So he created all the software in the libraries around the kernel. So when Linus decided to do this project, he was filling a void that had not been done yet. And he started the project in 1991, and by May of 1994, version 1.0 of the kernel had come out. So May of 1994 is 25 years from 2019. So we got 50, we got 25. Yes. Uh, and uh, Linus Torvalds, how, how old was he when he released it? When he released it, I, I can't remember um, exactly his age. He was probably around 24 years old, maybe 25, because in 2019, he will be 50 years old. That's another round number right there. Yes, it is. Also, uh, 30 years before 2019 was the invention of the World Wide Web. That was uh, started by Tim Berner-Lee, and that was started, uh, I believe, uh, 1989. Um, so there's a lot of things that are round numbers of anniversary dates that 2019 represents. Uh, 1969 was the first people to walk on the moon. So it was a highly 
technical people were getting very interested in computers and science and things like that. 1969, I wrote my first program as a programmer. 69? Yes. On, on what? What would you do? Well, my first program was written in Fortran using punch cards on an IBM 1130 computer. It was about the size of a refrigerator that was lying on its side. It had 4,016 bit words of memory. It had a hard disk drive that would hold one half megabyte. It had um, a center console with a keyboard and some switches that you could flip the switches and control your programs because it only ran one program at a time. Uh, it was not multitasking or multi-programming, just one program. And a lot of times you couldn't fit all of your data into the computer at one time. So basically you had to write your program to maybe make multiple passes of your data through your program to do the processing. And uh, what did you do with the Unix? Well, I, I, after I graduated from university, I went to work for a very large insurance company, uh, Aetna Life and Casualty. We were the largest commercial user of IBM equipment in the free world. We automatically ordered two of everything that IBM announced. No salesperson had to call us. When they announced it, we had two headed our way. Did not make any difference whether it was a $32,000 disk drive or a $2.5 million uh, mainframe. We ordered it right away. And we had uh, a huge, for that time, a huge development staff. We had about 4,000 programmers. We had 32,000 terminals around the United States in a real-time transaction processing system that we, ran, we wrote ourselves in assembler language. We, um, it was a very heady place for a young man directly out of university to work, and I learned a lot from that. And stuff, uh, was, there was a lot of Unix and all that? We weren't using Unix back in those days. We were using IBM's MVS and things because remember this was 1973 and Unix still wasn't a real operating system to use. It was still being developed by Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie in Bell Labs and some people at Berkeley were getting into it. But you know, nobody was using Unix in those days. Over time, universities started using Unix because they liked to see how the operating system was written. They liked to experiment on top of it. And the telephone company itself started using Unix for some of its work, particularly in real-time switching. There was a special version of Unix called MERT, which was, and, which was used and, for, for my knowledge, is still used today in telephone switching systems. So after I... Uh, worked for a while at Aetna. I went and got one of the first master's in computer science degrees because before that, if you were to work with computers, you did not get a computer science degree. They did not have a computer science degree. You would get a degree in physics with computers or mathematics with computers or chemistry with computers. But the, the idea that somebody would be a professional programmer, that's how they would earn their living was not really blessed back in those days. In fact, I had a professor tell me, John, you will never be able to earn a living as a professional programmer. And I'm still waiting to see if he was right. <laughs> so uh, the open source stuff and monetizing open source is not an easy thing, right? So when, when did you get involved with the Linux stuff? Well, so after I left Aetna, I went to teach for three and a half years at a small two-year technical college. And back in those days, when students came to my classes, it was the first time they ever touched any computer of any type in real life. They saw them in movies, they saw them on TV, but there were no computers in the home. There were no, you know, phone, cell phones, obviously. After that, I went to work for Bell Labs. And there I became a Unix systems administrator without ever having seen a Unix system before. So I had to learn it very rapidly, which I was able to do with all the other experience I had on different computer systems. Did it look great, the Unix? Was it interesting? 
It was very interesting because most of the systems up until that time did not have a hierarchical file system. They had a flat file system with maybe a directory uh, pointing to your data. Um, they, like I said, they were typically huge monolithic kernels. And here was this very small kernel with a very small set of interfaces and a large number of libraries. But the most interesting thing was the large number of utilities that came along with Unix. So the spell command, cat, ls, all of the different Unix commands and the pipes that separated them. So the commands were filters and the data passed through the different filters to come out the other side. And this was a, a different concept. It was a concept that was created by Doug McElroy of Bell Labs. He had to write some of the first Unix commands to show to Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, what he was talking about. So this is a very interesting operating system. And as I, as I used it more and more, I learned to appreciate the thought that had gone into creating this system. I worked there at Bell Labs for about three and a half years, and then I went to Digital Equipment Corporation to go into their Unix group to, to bring about the commercial version of Unix to sell to Dex customers. I was very impressed with digital. I was impressed with their management and their, their philosophy. I appreciate the fact that they seem to produce very good hardware, and uh, I thought that Unix would be a good thing. I had a variety of jobs there. Uh, started off with programmer, uh, product manager, and then eventually I was in technical marketing with my job of taking complex subjects and making them simple for the customers to understand. And looking at the customer's problems and bringing them back to the engineers so we could figure out the best way of solving them. It was in that function that I met Linus Torvalds in May of 1994. I saw Linux for the first time. Uh, we had just come out with the Alpha processor. We had the same problem that many people have with a new operating system or architecture. We had a great operating system, but we had no applications. And so I was looking for something that could go and that all the source code would be available. Because with digital Unix, the source code was still not available. And when I saw Linux, I said, this is the perfect thing to put on top of the alpha to allow people to do research and to be able to spread the research to the people who need it, to be able to spread the research through the use of source code. If you try and do research on a closed source proprietary system, and particularly research on making the kernel better, you can't really distribute the parts of your system that are good. You only can write papers about it, or maybe distribute diffs in your code, but you can't redistribute the code that you got from the closed source system. With Linux, you could do that. And so it became easy for other researchers to help you make your product better. So was it like a big conference, or did you sit down with Linus Torvalds? Did you say, oh, this looks awesome? What, he, what was your first impression? Well, the very first impression was given to me by a friend of mine, Kurt Riesler, who is the chairman of the Linux Special Interest Group in an organization called DECUS. When I was a university student, I could not afford the $100,000 that it cost to buy a compiler. And so I would go to DECUS, and DECUS would let me have a compiler for maybe five US dollars. And this was a great thing for a university student to have access to all this software. Decus had user group meetings, but I could not afford to go. So I just bought hardware or bought software from the Decus organization. Later on, when I went to work for uh, Bell Laboratories, they would send me to these Decus meetings, and I got to meet some of these people I had only corresponded with. Decus in those days was around 19,000 people going to the conference. And we would hold the conferences twice a year. And there were other people who also got software from the Decus libraries, also shared and improved it. 
And so there's this, this culture of sharing of information. We had special interest groups inside of DECAS. Some people were interested in compilers, some people were interested in networking, some people were interested in security. And this one special interest group, Unisig, was interested in Unix systems. Kurt was the president, very unusual person. And in May of 1994, he started sending these emails to people, to these little companies saying, we'd like to bring this guy from Europe to Dicas in New Orleans, and we would like to, uh, we, we want to pay his way, so could you contribute money? And all these little companies would write back and say, well, we'd like to, but we're very small. We don't have some money, but we could give you some CDs to hand out. And after about 15 or 20 of these letters, and Kurt always copied me on this. So after about 15 or 20 of these letters went past, I went to my management and I said, I don't know who this guy is. I don't know what he did, but sometimes Kurt has good ideas. I think we should fund this. So my management went to their management. They said, we don't know who this guy is, but we don't know uh, what he did. And we don't know who Kurt is, but Mad Dog sometimes has good ideas. So I think we should fund this. And we got $5,000 to bring this person from Helsinki, Finland, of all god awful places, to New Orleans for Dikas. Now, for those people who may be watching this video and are not familiar with New Orleans, I will tell you that there are two adult Disneylands on the face of the earth. One of them is Las Vegas and the other is New Orleans. And in those two places, and particularly in Bourbon Street in New Orleans, you can get anything you want and a lot of things you don't want. So we went down there. Oh, I forgot one thing. Not only did we fund the $5,000, but Kurt wanted a PC to run this software one. And that was almost the thing that killed the deal because we made real computer systems, VAX computer systems, MIPS workstations, Alpha systems, real systems, not those weak, miserable, crappy Intel PCs. And Kurt wanted a weak, miserable, crappy Intel PC to put this software on. So I got him one of those, flew down to Dekas, found Kurt, he was trying to install this software on a weak, miserable, crappy Intel PC. And along comes this nice young man with sandy brown hair, wearing wool socks and sandals and said, can I help you? And Kurt looks at him and smiles and says, I think you can. And about 10 minutes later, Linux, or GNU Linux as some people call it, was now running on this weak, miserable, crappy Intel PC. And Linus and Kurt invited me to sit down and use it. Now, you can play a piano, and you can have a piano that's well-tuned, and you can actually get good music out of it. But if you play a really great piano, all of the keys have the same weight, all of the keycaps are the same height, and it's just beautiful. It's a pleasure to play that piano. This was how Linux felt on that weak, miserable, crappy PC. Because if I thought of it as System 5, it was System 5. If I thought of it as Berkeley, it was Berkeley. And it was very responsive and very peppy. And I said to myself, oh my God, this is wonderful. And Linus gave two talks at that time. He attracted about 60 people to each talk. And I listened to his explanation of why he did Linux and what was happening. And I started thinking to myself, this is the answer. This is what we need to put on top of the alpha to allow researchers to look at how to use very large address spaces. Because Linux at that time was a 32-bit system. And in 32 bits, you can look at four gigabytes of data at one time. And that sounds like a lot, unless you're trying to model a 747 plane, or unless you're trying to render Lord of the Rings, or unless you're trying to do what I call real programming. Because at that point, your data 
is, is so big it fills your address space. And as you go from one address space to the other, you have to do what we call edge programming. And that's very complex to do, and it can also cause mistakes in your program. But with a 64-bit address space, you can pull in all of your data at one time into the virtual address space because you can have four billion times four billion. So how big is that? That allows you to fill up one gigabyte disk every second of the day for the next 5,386 years and still not run out of address space. Or to store 128 bytes of data for every square millimeter on the surface of the Earth, including all the oceans. It's a lot of data. And I wanted people to do research in how to do this, and I wanted him to be able to spread their research in source code form. So that night, I took Linus out on the Natchez Riverboat. It's the last steamboat that goes up and down the Mississippi River. They play nice jazz on there, and they serve these wonderful alcoholic drinks called hurricanes. And the reason they're called hurricanes is because after you've had two of them, you feel like you've been hit by Katrina. And we're going up and down the river on the front of the boat, drinking these hurricanes. And I said to Linus, <coughs> Linus, have you ever thought about putting Linux to the alpha, a 64-bit system, a risk system, to get rid of the Intelisms inside of the kernel. And he said, well, I would like to do that, but the deck office in Helsinki, Finland has been having trouble getting me an alpha. And I may have to do the power PC instead. Ah! And I dropped my hurricane and I never drop a drink. I said, don't do anything rash. And I went back to my office at Digital Equipment Corporation in New Hampshire and I called up a friend of mine. Now, people may think that the way you get things done inside of a large corporation is that you write a proposal and you give that to your management and they look at it and de think deep thoughts and stuff like that, but that's not the way you get things done. The way you get things done is you pull in favors. And since I'd worked for digital for 16 years at that point, I started pulling in favors. There are lots of people who owed me favors particularly a person named Jim Jackson. And I called him up and said, Jim, I need to have an alpha system sent to Helsinki, Finland right away. I don't have time to tell you who it's for or, what, or why I need it. I just need it. Now... So, so you ask, uh, sorry, the battery cut. You ask to, to send the battery, uh, no, send the alpha to Finland? Right. So I called up Jim Jackson and I said, Jim, I need to have this alpha, an alpha system sent to Helsinki, Finland right away. I don't have time to tell you who it's for or why. I just need to have it. Now, the Alpha systems back in those days, they weren't like a PC. They weren't really inexpensive. And they were still relatively new and rare. There were a lot of engineers at Digital that did not have an Alpha system to work on of their own. They had to go out in the laboratory and wear earmuffs to protect their ears from the large machines we had there. So this was very bad that I was asking for this system that was still very rare to be sent to this person for no justification whatsoever other than me saying it has to be done. So Jim says, well, fortunately, I have an alpha system that just came back from a customer and I have it here in my office. It has, and remember, this is 1994, it has 96 megabytes of main memory it has a four gigabyte hard drive. It has a 4X CD-ROM. It has a 19 inch CRT monitor, a 3D, diamond 3D graphics board, keyboard and mouse. And its cost is $30,000 in 1994. I said, that's great. If you throw in a $6,000 tape drive so we can do backups, you have a deal. And by this time, Jim is laughing. He says, what are you gonna pay for? I said, I'll pay for the postage, the shipping. And so the next day, that system was headed to Helsinki, Finland, and Linus had it. And that started the Alpha Linux project. How long did it take uh, him to port the Linux on that? Well, remember that 
the first version of Linux, Linux version 1.0, had only come out in April of 1994. So Linus wanted to bring out version 1.2. He wanted to make 1.0 stable, fix the bugs in it. So he didn't start the project right away. But what he did was start reading the documentation about the alpha and figure in his mind how he wanted to lay out the source code tree. And instead of making it only two architectures, Intel and Alpha, he decided to make it N architectures, so that in the future, other architectures could also be supported. We actually started the project in January the 1st of 1995, and after nine months, the, the software was effectively ported. And this was done by people who did not meet each other face to face. It was all done over the internet. And it was probably one of the most amazing projects I ever worked on. I went into digital and I found an engineering group that was willing to help with some of the low level things. And one of those people was Mr. David Rustling, who worked for the digital semiconductor group who helped to build the alpha. And digital and then, uh, David wrote a loader, a bootloader called Milo, which was a lot like Lilo, except it was for the alpha. This was David's first sojourn into uh, open source. He didn't know anything about it, but later on, he actually became the instigator of Linero and the chief technical officer of Linero, as well as an ARM fellow. So this was David's introduction into free and open source software. So um, you, you say that this is a risk processor. Um, so in some ways similar to the ARM or? Yes, in a lot of ways it's similar to the ARM. Uh, very reduced instruction set. So many years ago, in around 1937, there were these two people. One was named Alan Turing and the other was named Maurice Wilkes. They were classmates at the University of Cambridge and they were both very brilliant. Alan Turing is credited with creating the concepts of modern day computers. And uh, Maurice Wilkes also worked on computers. Now, Alan Turing tended to believe in making a minimal instruction set and then just giving it lots of memory and lots of speed. Maurice Wilkes believed in creating the computer to use microcode so that each assembly language or machine instruction would be doing something specific to some type of a problem. And for many years, there were, these, there were these fights between them as to which was the right philosophy. Now, Intel and AMD and some other ones like IBM uh, 360 and the PDP-11, those are complicated instruction set computers and they use microcode. Um, the ARM, the uh, MIPS processor and, and the Alpha were all reduced instruction set computers. And so they have very simple instructions, but they use the space on the silicon to have more registers, more cache, and they, they utilize the compiler to generate the instructions in, in the most optimistic, uh, optimal way to, to run the code. So the Alpha, uh, we would typically run it at very high clock frequencies with a lot of cache and a lot of registers and it was and a very wide data bus, which we could all do because we weren't taking up the silicon with multiple copies of microcode. And uh, the Alpha for a long period of time was the world's fastest microcomputer. It was actually listed in uh, the Guinness Book of Records as the fastest microcomputer. Eventually, Digital Semiconductor Division was sold off to Intel. Uh, by that time, a lot of the technologies of the Alpha had actually moved into companies like AMD, Intel, and ARM. So a lot of modern day processors uh, take the technology that was developed at Digital in the Alpha processor and implement it in their own. So what you're saying is that the Alpha and the ARM and uh, uh, are kind of like uh, the idea came kind of from the Alan Turing already. It well, was, so he's he is like he's kind of like the founder of what 
what became Risk and what became Arm and what? Well, Alan Turing, uh, what he did, which kind of woke up everybody, was he recognized that there's two types of problems in the world. There are problems that can be solved and there are problems that can't be solved. So what's the example of a problem that can't be solved? What is the last digit of pi? There is none. It goes on forever. What is the last digit of E? There is none. It goes on forever. But what is the answer of 2 plus 2? That's easy. It's 4. And that is a computable result. right? As far as the parts that are not solvable, we may be able to get close enough for government work. And so even though they're not solvable, if you get them to the point where they're close enough, that's OK. And Alan Turing put this down in a paper. And then he stated that if a problem is solvable, it can be solved by a digital computer. And you know, as long as a digital computer has enough time and memory to solve the problem. So everybody started looking at this and saying, oh my god, this is true. And they started thinking about computational and automating the processes. There was actually a person who many years before had thought about much the same thing. His name was Charles Babbage. And he created the Babbage Difference Engine, an analytical engine back in around the 1860s. He had a mathematician who helped write programs for this. And her name was Ada Lovelace. She was the daughter of Lord Byron. And most people consider her to be the first programmer. Uh, many years later, when, com when electronic and electromechanical computers came into being, uh, another lady became known as the first modern day programmer. And her name was Rear Admiral Grace Murray Hopper. She helped to program the Mark I computer that was the first electronic digital computer built in the United States. So, um, so that's that's awesome and fascinating. The the with, with all that stuff from the from the past, and but uh, you you also said that it was fascinating to port the Linux on the Alpha. So, it was an IRC chat room. Uh, how did it actually go? Did you ha did you have to travel and go and sit in a room work with somebody else? Oh no no the, no the, the the entire porting of Linux was done completely over the internet. Um, Lidas announced that he was going to do the port. There were people who liked Linux. They knew about the Alpha. They knew how fast it was. And they actually went out and purchased Alphas on their own to simply help with this port. $30,000 Alphas. Well, at that time, uh, there were certain parts of the Alpha that had come out very early. And they would end up in electronic junk shops stripped of their memory, stripped of their disks and everything. People go to these electronic junk shops, buy that alpha part, put in their own memory, their own disk, and come up with an alpha system at a much lower price. But yes, it was very expensive. And these people did it because they wanted to see the Linux project successful, and they wanted to see it run on a 64-bit processor. And that was 1995 around, right? 1995, yeah. Uh, so, ARM was uh, in those uh, uh, Acorn computers. Mm -hmm. They were doing their RISC OS. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, f I guess, well, when did Linux start on the ARM? Well, that I don't really know. Um, I haven't really kept track of when. Because after that, there was a whole series of different ports to different architectures. Actually, David Miller had started a port to the Spark architecture, Sun Spark architecture, even before we started the Alpha Linux port. But that was that was taken as an offshoot uh, or a fork of Linus's tree. The Alpha was the first port that Linus himself had cooperated in, and therefore I knew that the support would still be there, you know, in the future. That because if you do a fork and the code starts going off like this, you're not sure you're going to have the same functionality in both, both different types of the kernel. And that's what you want. You don't want to have one kernel with one functionality and another kernel with another functionality. Right? You need to keep that in sync. And by having Linus participate in this port, 
I knew that it would be in sync. And by uh, getting him uh, to agree to help uh, to get it ported over on the risk, it kind of uh, it was a forefather of getting arm support and. Uh, oh yeah. Absolutely, because then every other port to other processors could be done with Linus's source code tree, not somebody else's source code tree that was forked off to something else. And it's, is it amazing to think that uh, Linux is like the dominant OS in the world, everywhere, it's in everything? Well, it's a funny thing about that because after I met Linus, I went back to my engineering group in New Hampshire and told all the engineers about this wonderful operating system called Linux and everything. And they looked at me and they said, well, we've been using it for like six months. We've been using Linux on Intel to do our development work because we can put Linux on a laptop computer, take it out to the middle of our backyard underneath a tree and work on it out there instead of having to work on it on a VAC system or an alpha system you know, in the office or at our work. And then once we have our code compiling and working on Linux, we bring it in and compile and get it working on Alpha or Vax or whatever system they were working on. So once again, I, I felt that I was moving in the right direction. If this is where the way my engineers worked, Ooh. I thought I was going in the right direction because if this is what my engineers were doing, then I, I, I felt I was moving in the right direction. So it was, uh, it was a pretty heady thing to do this, right? And my management thought I was extremely crazy. And why are you spending your time on this? You should be promoting digital Unix. I said, I am promoting digital Unix because digital Unix, even though it was a great operating system, it didn't spark the minds of the researchers. It was just another operating system, but Linux, sparked the imaginations of the researchers, the educational people. And because of that, they started thinking about DEC again. When you are looking for an operating system or an architecture to solve your problem, you usually create a short list of the number of companies you want to talk to. And back in those days, if you were doing Unix, the first company you thought of was Sun. Then maybe you would think of IBM or Hewlett Packard, and usually DEC was third or fourth. But when you're third or fourth on a list, you may as well not even exist. And there was a lot of people that just never thought about DEC. But when the Alpha program, when the, when the Alpha Linux program started, it brought, made digital visible again. And I had letters from people who wrote to me and said, I just bought 3,000 digital Unix servers. I would not even have thought of digital if it hadn't been for the Alpha Linux project. And uh, you, you were saying that earlier you were uh, uh, in that company where they had two of IBM, two of each. Uh, two, you would just get two of whatever new stuff they would announce. Like right now, for example, you just got two of the, we can check it out, the, the newest, uh, the f most interesting, and you, you're getting lots of 96 boards too and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. So right here you have two of the, this is maybe the most powerful. Um. This little board right here is one of the 96 boards. It's called the High Key 970. And it, special, it has a special chip on there which is made for doing artificial intelligence work. Neural networks and things like that. It was especially designed. And I'm going to be taking this board to the University of Sao Paulo where they have an a artificial intelligence club and I'm going to be allowing them to do some development work on this. So, uh, uh, and, and uh, so the, the students from that university, potentially, maybe, uh, get more and more involved with the Linaro stuff and they might be joining Linaro in the future, right? That's Is that entirely, what happens? That's entirely possible, but even if they don't join Linaro, I'm trying to stimulate students to think beyond what uh, it might be the Raspberry Pi. I, I love the Raspberry Pi program, and I love the Raspberry Pi people. I know many of them personally from the years gone past. But when the first Raspberry Pi came out, I looked at it and said, you know, it's a half a gigabyte of memory. It's a single core processor. And even though it's great 
that students can get this for a cheap amount of money is not a challenge to a university student. Later on, they added more memory, they had more cores. Now it's becoming a little bit interesting because you could do multi-thread programming on it. You can experience what happens when you write a program that is multi-thread. But it's still missing things like field programmable gate arrays, like digital signal processing chips, like you know a whole series of different, more modern processors. ARM has a series of little boards that we call Big Little, where you have four cores that run a little slower, but they use a lot less power, and four cores that use a lot of power, but they're very fast. And when you put your operating system on there, the operating system can use those cores depending upon how much load you have. And so to, to teach students how to program this and how to make, how to make it efficient, is one of the things we should be teaching in computer science and computer engineering. It is the future, the heterogeneous, multi-core, all that big little stuff, scheduler, and it's the, at the core of what Linaro is specializing, in, right? Yes, because I, I give a talk about what is performance. And in, in, in the days that I was programming mainframe computers, performance was simply how fast can you get your program to work on a computer system. But these days, performance is measured in a different way. It's measured by how long does a battery in your cell phone last? How much heat does your cell phone produce? Uh, it's measured by real-time support. How, you know, can you meet the needs? Because your nuclear power plant is melting. Can you, can you shut the nuclear power plant down before it explodes? These are the types of things that determine performance, you know, uh, performance is, I need to be able to analyze 10 terabytes of data or 10 petabytes of data very quickly. These are the types of things we need. There's, there's, a, there's a satellite up in space which is transmitting data down you know, at gigabytes per second. I have to filter that data to find that one thing I'm looking for. I don't care about the rest of the data, I just need that little bit. And these are all things that have to do with performance. And you don't do that with Java. I'm sorry, you don't. You know, you need to know more than that. Get into the deep, deep of the hardware and all these development boards and also the one with Xilinx with the FPGA is interesting. Absolutely. That one? Yes, the, the Xilinx board is very interesting to me because it has an FPGA, a very nice FPGA built into it and FPGAs can, can do certain types of processing hundreds of times faster than a, a regular core-based computer. Uh, it also can do processing with a lot less use of electrical power, which is very important in this world these days. We have so many difficult and gigantic problems to solve, and we need to be smart about how we solve them and the use of FPGAs and digital signal processing chips is one of those ways. And the students, the university students, are hopefully going to be able to solve all these problems. Well, in the last couple of uh, connects, I've had Professor Marcelo Zufo come here, and because of a side comment I made to him one time about how you could do a GPU using an FPGA, he actually had a student create a G <coughs> pardon me. He actually had a student create a GPU out of an FPGA. Now why is that important? Uh, it's important because in a lot of embedded systems, you may need a GPU just to do some simple 3D graphics, anti-aliasing, blending of background and foreground, you know, fog effects, things like that. Nothing complex and nothing that's very high power. But if you stick a regular GPU in there, you get a lot of vendors who say, I'm not gonna give you all of the code for the, for the GPU in source code. I'm gonna create a binary blob that you have to put into your system. And every time you change the kernel, I'll give you a new copy of that binary blob so that it'll still continue to work. Well, they may do that for the first two years, three years, five years, 
But after a while, they lose interest in this. They may go out of business. And the person who has this little computer is now stuck. They cannot upgrade their system. And eventually the system will die. So if you were able to do this GPU functionality in an open source FPGA, well, then you'd have all the source code you needed and you could keep building that forever. And so for longevity of the functionality of the little computer, if you're putting it in your elevator, if you're putting it in your car, your bus, your train, your plane, that has to last 10, 15, 20 years, this would be a solution that people could use. Cool. And the student did this work in only three months. So it's going to be very interesting to see what's going to happen in, uh, with those students in the right. future. And uh, so uh, let's do another video just after. Let's talk about this, uh, this company you have right there okay. going on.